Uh, to begin this morning's message, I want to testify that there are, in fact, incredible, amazing blessings and benefits to being a believer in Jesus Christ and a follower of our Lord. Amen? I mean, the songs this morning, we were singing about it, we're ransomed, we're redeemed, uh, we have hope, we have the hope of glory, we've been forgiven, uh, we've been, we have so much going for us as believers in the Lord. And I don't know about you, I wouldn't trade it for another walk in the whole wide world. Amen? You can say amen. I, I do find that encouraging once in a while. It lets me know you're still with me and, 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 and that good kind of stuff, okay? However, I think it's also important for us to acknowledge, friends, that the Christian life has its challenges. The Christian life is not always easy. And one of the biggest challenges in the Christian life can be the seeming extended silence of God when we go through prolonged, ongoing, distressing seasons in our lives. The troubling times when we look to and call out to the Lord for help, but the answers that we're, we're hoping to get don't seem to be readily forthcoming. Consequently, God's apparent silence during prolonged difficult times adds more stress on top of our distress to the point that we become a distress mess. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been there and done that, right? Been a distressed mess with all the things piling up, and it doesn't seem for some reason or another that God seems to be answering or intervening as quickly as I'd like. And maybe, again, you have experienced uh, the silence of God, so to speak, in some distressing season of your life. Maybe you're going through such a time in your life right now. And if not, just wait. <laughs> just wait. Because uh, one of those seasons is likely going to be coming your way at one time or another. If it encourages you, and I hope it does, King David in the Bible experienced distressful silence of God's seasons. And there were times when King David, who God declared was a man after his own heart, there were occasions when David pleaded with the Lord our God not to keep silent during troubling circumstances. For example, during a very difficult time in his life, King David began Psalm 28 this way. He said, To you, O Lord, I call, my rock be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit, with the pit being a metaphor for the grave. On another troubling occasion in Psalm 109, verses 1 through 3, David called out to God. He said, Be not silent, God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. Friend, maybe you've been there, done that, in a distressing season of your life. You've called out to God, you've reached out to God, and he, he doesn't seem to be answering you as quickly as you'd like. You might even have the t-shirt too, as they used to say. You know, I'm a distressed mess still waiting on God. You know, maybe something like that. King David knew what that was like. He knew what it's like to go through long, drawn-out periods of time when despite praying, despite calling, despite crying out to God for help, it seemed that the Lord remained silent. Actually, one of the reasons I love so many of the psalms in the Bible is their rawness. The rawness, the rawness in honesty, the rawness of anguish, the, on, uh, the, the rawness of the struggle when God seems silent or doesn't seem to be as close or nearby as you would like him to be. In fact, our psalm today, Psalm 13, is one of those raw psalms of King David. And it's obvious right from the beginning of the psalm because we see right off the bat David's hard questions for God. That's number one on your outline. It's a kind of a short-looking outline. Don't expect a short message, though. David's hard questions for God. In the first two verses, David writes, and, and if you don't mind, I'm, I'm not just going to... Our, our brother read it very beautifully, but I, I think I'm, I'd like to read it with a little more of the oomph that I thought David himself might have expressed it. So don't be alarmed. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Okay. 
Now, I don't know about you, but one of the first things I notice here is that Psalm 13 does not begin like King David's beloved 23rd Psalm. There is no, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, beginning in Psalm 13. Nor does it begin like King David's Psalm 103. There is no, praise the Lord, O my soul, O my inmost being, praise his holy name, beginning in Psalm 13. Rather, during a very hard time in King David's life, he gets right to it. There's no praise God, I'm glad to be here, boom. He's right to it by asking some seriously perplexing questions for God, about God and his struggles. Four times, at least in the first two verses, David asked God some troubling questions. And notice, friends, that David at this point is beyond the why God stage of question asking. Are you familiar with the why God stage of question asking? Yeah, I won't ask you to raise your hands because you may not want to be called out, but, but I'll be glad to raise mine. If you've ever asked a why God question in your life, yeah, yeah go ahead, timidly put them up so that those behind you and before you don't see you. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I appreciate that, brother. I, I don't know. Were you raising your hand or waving at me? No, never mind. Ne- okay. You know, the why, stage, uh, why God stage a question asking where we're going through some trying difficulty or problem or diffic- trouble of some kind, and we're asking, why God? Why God didn't you do this? Why, why didn't you answer my prayer? Why did you allow this to happen? And typically we ask those questions, I think, because in our pain and in our struggle, we're often trying to gain understanding of our circumstances that don't make sense to us. And if God would just simply explain to us what it is that's going on and what he is or is not doing and why, it it would be better. Well, I'm here to tell you, I know I heard the amen, but I'm 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 gonna take a little different take. Um, I've lived long enough, friends, to, to no longer believe that's true. I, I'm convinced that during my why God times where I've asked God why questions, if he would have really answered me, I'm not sure, one, I would have nearly come close to comprehending it. And I'm not really sure that even if he did, that it would necessarily comfort me in the pain or the struggle that I was going through. And we see here, in David's case, because we often think the why God questions are like the ultimate questions, I I think David goes beyond that and takes it to a different level. He's at the how long, O Lord, stage of question asking. The how long, O Lord, stage of question. That that is, how long, O Lord, is this going to go on stage of question asking. The how long, O Lord, I really don't care why anymore stage of question asking. I wonder, have you ever felt that way yourself in some struggle? You know, how long? How long is it going to keep going on? How long till it ends? And have you ever told God so? To me, the questions David asked of God in Psalm 13 verses 1 and 2 were very personal and quite painful. The first two questions, in fact, for God were about God. Did you notice that? His first two questions for God are about God himself. The first is, how long, O Lord, will you forget me? Did you get that? How long, O Lord, will you forget me? How long, O Lord, will you ignore me? That is, how long, O Lord, will you seem remote and distant from me? Forever? Forever? Folks, no believer in the Lord of the Bible likes feeling that God has forgotten him or her. We don't like feeling as though God has somehow lost track of us or is ignoring us. We don't like the idea that God may somehow, for some reason, be far away from us. And yet, that's how King David felt about God in Psalm 13. Maybe you felt that way about God, too at some time, or two, or three, or more in your life. David's second question for God about God was, how long would God hide his face from him? That is, how long will you, as the face was often a a personal expression of the person himself or herself, how long will you hide your face from me? How long will you turn away from me? How long, O Lord, will you withhold your favorable gaze from me? 
Friends, again, no believer in the true Lord God likes feeling that the Lord has hidden himself from him or her, or that the Lord has turned away and withheld his favor from them. But in Psalm 13, that's how David felt about God. And sometimes, maybe you felt that way toward God too. David also had questions for God about his inner inward turmoil. He had questions for God about God, but he also had a question for God about his inward turmoil, his inward stuff. In verse 2, David asked the Lord how long he would have to, to take counsel in his soul. How long would he have to continue to to try and take counsel in his very troubled soul or mind? How long would he have to wrestle with his thoughts every day and have sorrow in his heart and his mind? How long would he have to be burdened by the cares that were piling up inside his soul? How long would he have to be constantly plagued by the distressing turmoil that was going on inside of him? Oh, yeah, how many of us can relate to that? We often find in our distressing seasons of life, the troubles that we go through, that the the biggest struggle isn't necessarily what's outside of us, it's what's going on inside of us, in our souls, our spirit, our mind, as we struggle. David wasn't done at the end of verse 2. We see that he also had a how long, O Lord, question for God about his outward trouble. He's covering the bases here, friends. He he had questions for God about God, questions for God about his inward turmoil, and he also had a question for God about his outward trouble. How long would David's enemy triumph over him? How long would his enemy be exalted over him? How long would his enemy get the very best of him? Maybe you've asked the Lord a similar question about a person, persons, or problem that was outwardly troubling you. And in the Psalms, we find for David, most of the time, those outward troubles came from other people. Now, friends, I'm not exactly a genius, but from the first two verses of Psalm 13, this much seems to be clear. Key David was a very troubled man at this season of his life, this point in his life. He had big issues and hard questions for God, about God, as well as as questions about his inward and outward struggles. And he just wanted to know how much longer God was going to let it all go on. Perhaps even as we have during prolonged seasons of great distress. Before we, in fact, go on, I want to pause to emphasize something very important. I might even refer to it as an LTA, a life-transforming application. LTA is much shorter. And it's simply this, and I hope you'll hear it. It's okay for you to ask God your hard questions. Did you hear it? It's okay for you to ask God your hard questions. By all means, feel free to ask the Lord your seemingly difficult questions. Ask him your why God questions. Ask him your how long, O Lord, questions. He is more than great enough and able enough to handle them. Now, this may seem so obvious that I shouldn't even have to emphasize it, but over the years in ministry and and other settings, it seems to me that a lot of Christians are uneasy about asking the Lord their hard questions. It's like they, they may feel that it isn't right or acceptable or, you know, demonstrates, you know, doesn't demonstrate great faith, you know, if you question God and, and let alone ask questions of God. Now, if you were among those folks, friends, God bless you, but let me also encourage you to simply take and consider the example of King David. King David, the man after God's own heart, dared to ask God his hard questions. And guess what? He lived to tell about it. Isn't that awesome? Some of you aren't quite used to me yet. You will be by the time we're done. Folks, I can't tell you, this is incredibly great news. 
It is great news for David and for you and me that in Psalm 13, there are verses 3 through 6 after verses 1 and 2. Hallelujah. Praise God, Psalm 13 did not end after verse 1, let alone after verse 2, because at the very least, we know that God did not vaporize David on the spot for daring to ask him his hard questions. Daring to ask his hard questions for God about God, as well as his inward and outward issues. There's no indication in our text that the Lord intervened after verse 2 and said, Wait a minute, David. You've gone too far now. You, who do you think you are asking me those kinds of questions? Who do you think you're talking to anyway? I'm not going to stand for it. And boom, pulverizes David into a zillion little pieces of glitter. No, we don't find that, friends. We don't find God doing that to David here. And I don't believe he would do it to us either. It's okay to ask the Lord your hard questions too. He's more than great enough to handle all of our hard and difficult questions. However, when you ask God your seemingly difficult questions, please remember this. And this is another one of those little LTAs, life transforming application. When you're struggling and asking God your agonizing questions, remember that the most important thing is the depth and strength of your personal relationship with the Lord. Okay? When you're you're struggling, you're agonizing over your difficulties and the troubles, the distresses and the messes in your life, the most important or pretty close to it thing you have going for you is the depth and strength of your personal relationship with the Lord. In other words, during distressing times, the most important thing is not getting answers to your questions from God. It's not, the most important thing is not getting what you want from God. During difficult times, indeed any time, the most important thing for you and me is the depth and strength of our personal relationship with the Lord. Amen. Now, a lot of people and you probably know people who do not have a personal relationship with the Lord, many times they don't have a problem asking God their hard questions. You know, when it's useful to them, or God might be useful because they can't seem to do anything about it, right? And they may ask him their hard questions, but when the Lord does not answer them just the way they want him to, just when they want him to, they often turn away from him for good. When God doesn't answer some Christians' questions, some Christians' prayers quickly and satisfactorily, they may become bitter toward the Lord. They may still believe in Him, but they more or less stop following Him and maybe even become apathetic toward Him because God didn't come through the way I wanted Him to. Yet this was not the case for King David in Psalm 13. And hopefully it won't be the case for you either, friends. In the first part of Psalm 13, verse 3, David says, Listen, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? How does David refer to the Lord here? How? My God. My God, the Lord was David's God. Yes, to be sure, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, was the God of the nation of Israel. But the Lord was also David's God. David believed in, embraced, and affirmed the Lord as his God. He had a profoundly deep, strong personal relationship with the Lord such that David was all in committed to the Lord, and he believed that the Lord was all in committed to him. And it was because of that deep, strong, mutual commitment and personal relationship between him and the Lord that David could then boldly ask God his very perplexing questions. So important. So when asking God his difficult questions, I don't believe that in doing so, David doubted God's care. That's not it at all. 
It was because David knew God cared for him and because David had a deep personal relationship with the Lord that David had the freedom. He had the freedom to ask the Lord his painful questions, even his questions about what God himself seemed to be doing or not doing that David may not have liked. Whoa. Without question, in spite of his difficult questions, David still believed in, embraced, and affirmed that the Lord was his God, my God. I wonder, though, how about you and me? How about you? How about me? Do we tend to treat God like an on-demand servant who we expect to, will do what we want him to do whenever we want him to do it? And when he doesn't, we kind of get mad and we pout and, and, and maybe we sort of draw back from him? Or do we boldly ask God our troubling questions and, and present our request to him out of a strong commitment to him and a growing personal relationship with him? In other words, through thick and thin, friends, can you say that the Lord is my God? Do you believe in, embrace, and affirm that the Lord is indeed your God? If you do not yet have a personal relationship with the Lord and desire to do so, I know there are people here in this wonderful church that would be glad to help you enter into and begin such a relationship today. Don't leave the house here without maybe talking with someone and allowing them to help you do that. Back to Psalm 13. I didn't forget. In this passage, King David did more than ask God his troubling questions. In verses 3 and 4, we see David's specific requests of God. David's specific requests of God. That's number two on the outline. David, had hard, David asked hard questions of God, and he also had specific requests of God. During a very distressing time in his life, David, in the context of his deeply personal relationship with God, made some pointed requests of the Lord, his God. And he emphasized some possible negative consequences that could take place if God didn't grant them. That's interesting. Take a look at that in a few moments. In Psalm 13, verses 3 and 4, David prays, and, and kind of continuing with a little out of motion, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Or as the 1984 NIV Bible puts it, Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Briefly, the three specific requests that David made of the Lord here are simply this, as follows. Consider me, answer me, give light to me. Consider me, answer me, give light to me. Back in verse 1, we saw that David felt as though God, what? Had forgotten him. That God had turned or hidden his face, hidden himself from David. And it's understandable that in the first part of verse 3, David pleaded with the Lord to do what? Consider me. See me. Look on me. Pay attention to me. Help me to know that I have your attention. I wonder, friends, in spite of your hard questions of God and your distress mess, would it help? Would you want assurance from the Lord that he's looking on you? That he sees you? That he's considering you? And not lost track of you? Count me in. Secondly, David also wanted the Lord his God to do what? Answer him. Oftentimes, you know, we Western Christians, I think, you know, what's your number? You know, if you'd ask God for anything, just answer all my quests, God. You know, answer my prayers. That's what I'm looking for. Well, for David, that was second. And I think he's, was on, he's onto something great there. First, he wants to make sure that the Lord is listening. He's tuning in. He's paying attention. He's looking on me. He's hearing me. And then he's desiring the Lord to answer his request. 
He wanted the Lord to either take away what was deeply troubling, that's usually our number one, or give him some sort of favorable word of encouragement to assure David that he had seen David, heard David, and was responding to him. I wonder, does that sound like something you'd ask the Lord for and want him to do for you during a prolonged, distressing season in your life? Huh? Would you like the Lord to answer you? Yes, please! Answer me, Lord! Huh. In his third specific request, David urged the Lord to what? Give light to my eyes, or to light up my eyes, lest David what? Sleep the sleep of death. Yikes. You see, in the Old Testament, one's eyes were often quite expressive and representative of the quality or vitality of one's life. And we kind of do that sometimes too. When, when someone comes in and their eyes are sparkling and they're just lit up like a Christmas tree, their eyes are bright, you kind of know things are probably going well. But when they're not feeling real great or they seem down, you can kind of tell just by looking at the eyes. Well, in the Old Testament, one's eyes could be dimmed, if you will, dimmed by grief, failing strength, unsatisfied longings, and or deferred hope, as a helpful note in the NIV study Bible suggests. In other words, to have your eyes go dim was a way of expressing that your life was slipping away, that your life was ebbing away. And I wonder, would it help if the Lord gave light to your eyes, that, it, that, that he would light up your eyes, as it were, in a prolonged distress mess season of your life? Would it, would it help him to help you to have him kind of bring that brightness and that lightness back to your eyes, that quality and vitality of life to help keep you going when you're not sure you can keep going? Me too. In fact, if David did not, if God did not grant David his request that he give light to his eyes, which had dimmed under his prolonged distressing stuff. David had a good idea what a very significant negative consequence would be. Without the Lord's divine intervention, David was certain that he would not make it. He was pretty certain that he was going to die. And if that happened, if David died, other serious negative consequences would come about because God did not grant David's requests. And that was, David's enemies would overcome him, they would triumph over him, as well as rejoice over his demise, his demise as he makes clear in verse 4. Now friends, think about that just for a moment or two. If David died while he expected the Lord his God to come to his aid against his enemies, it would convey to David's enemies that his God could not or would not save him. It might also convey that, that maybe David's God, his God, was punishing him or abandoning him. Ah, but whatever the case, his enemies would be glad to take credit for prevailing over him, for overcoming him, for triumph overing, uh, over him, and they would gladly rejoice over David's fall. They'd gladly rejoice over his misfortune. Nice guys, huh? No, they weren't nice guys at all. By laying out this scenario for the Lord, what was David conveying? Was David bartering with God here? Was David bargaining with God here? Hmm, I don't think so. Sometimes we do that in our prayers. God, if you do this, I'll do that. I'll do this if you do that. But David here, I believe, was sharing his perspective on the situation. And from David's perspective, there were far too many negative consequences that could result for David and the Lord if the Lord refused to hear and grant David's pointed requests. Wow. And it kind of gets me to wondering, have you ever prayed to God like that? You know, just shared your perspective? You know, Lord, I'm asking these requests, and, and if you don't grant them, I can see some not-so-good things kind of coming from this and, and leaving it with him. David was willing to do that, or he tried to. And you would think that 
Once David laid out his request and then especially highlighted the potential negative consequences if God didn't give him what he asked for, that the Lord would be inspired to quickly, immediately give David exactly what he requested, right? Yes? No? Not sure? Think it's a, quick, a trick question? I can assure you it is not a trick question. What comes next in Psalm 13? Well, let me tell you what doesn't come next. It apparently wasn't God immediately answering David's troubling questions in verses 1 and 2, and it wasn't God quickly giving David what he requested in verses 3 and 4. In fact, what comes next is something far, far better. In verses 5 and 6, the last two verses of the psalm, we see David's continuing commitment to God. That's the third point on your outline. David's continuing commitment to God. In Psalm 13, verses 5 and 6, David says to the Lord, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Folks, this is so beautiful. And hopefully inspiring. King David, during a prolonged, distressing time in his life, ends Psalm 13 by affirming his continuing commitment to God. Before the Lord answered his questions and granted his requests. Wow. You probably ought to add that to your outline. There is no indication in our text, friends, that David's situation had changed from verse 4 to verse 5. And it's also obvious that David's ongoing commitment to the Lord had not yet changed either. Even though the Lord had not yet addressed his perplexing questions and granted his urgent requests. Well, what's the nature of that continuing commitment that David had? First, in his troubled distress, David acknowledges that he had trusted in and was continuing to trust in the Lord, his God, and God's steadfast, unfailing love. That's what David was holding on to. David's security and confidence in the Lord was not in getting God to answer his questions and give him his request. That wasn't his primary security and confidence. He hoped, but that's not where his security and confidence was. David kept trusting in the Lord's hesed in Hebrew. That is, David trusted in God and his covenant love, God's loyal love, God's steadfast, unfailing love. David's primary hope in the midst of this terrible situation was trusting in the Lord his God who lovingly keeps his promises to his people and all that goes with it. So much so that secondly, in his distress mess, David would continue to commit in his heart to rejoice in the Lord's salvation. He would rejoice in the Lord's salvation. In other words, it would not be David's enemies at the end of the day who would be rejoicing over his downfall. Rather, it would be David who would be rejoicing in the Lord's deliverance. In Psalm 13, verse 5, the Hebrew word for salvation refers more to God's deliverance of his people from their distresses and their crises, which was more typical of an Old Testament understanding of God's salvation. And in an extended troubling time in his life, David was confident that he would in fact rejoice in the Lord's saving help for him, and he committed to do so, to rejoice in that salvation, before he actually experienced the Lord's saving help in that predicament. Wow. Thirdly, David concludes Psalm 13 by vowing, by promising to sing to the Lord. To sing to the Lord now, the future. Why? Because the Lord his God had been so good to him in the what? The past. In the past, God had been generous to David. The Lord his God had dealt bountifully with him. Not stingily, not miserly, but bountifully, abundantly. In his distress mess, David did not suffer from spiritual amnesia like sometimes I do when I'm in a distress mess. We often look at our present distresses like looking at a newsprint with a magnifying glass. The only thing we kind of see is what we're looking directly at. 
probably forget what's on page two or one earlier. David didn't forget in his current distress mess what God had done for him in the past. He recalled God's past goodness to him, how he had dealt bountifully with him. And as a result, David was committed to continue to sing to his God who had been so good to him. Friends, what David did in verses 5 and 6 is what I believe all believers in the Lord should do in their distress messes or any time. But I wonder, do you? Do I? Despite not having God yet answer your hard questions or grant your specific requests during troubling times, will you and I personally, will you all corporately as a local church continue to commit yourself, ourselves, myself, to trust in our Lord's love, to rejoice in His salvation, and sing to Him because of His past goodness to us, to you, to me, to us, no matter what? No matter what? I don't want, I don't want you leaving here today misunderstanding something. Okay? I, don't, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I am not encouraging you, friends, to deny your feelings about your difficult circumstances. I am not encouraging you to deny your troubled feelings about God or what He may or might not seem to be doing uh, for you in your difficult circumstances. It's not healthy to deny your feelings. It's not healthy to deny that you have feelings. But friends, neither is it healthy to let your feelings dictate or control your choices. It's not healthy to let your feelings determine the decisions that you need to make, especially critically important decisions. Why? Feelings come and go. They rise, they fall, they ebb, they flow, they come in, they go out. Often quickly. Though our feelings are an important part of who we are, we should not rely on our feelings alone to help us make important choices, important decisions, especially decisions regarding our ongoing, continuing commitment to God. We need to rely on the truth, the truth we know about the Lord that we find in His written word, the Bible, what it teaches us about Him and His nature. We need to to rely on on the Holy Spirit's work in our lives in building that personal relationship with the Lord. Because, friends, even when you feel God is far away from you, even when you feel He does not care for you, you feel He's hidden Himself from you, or you feel He is not doing enough for you, does not make it so. Your feelings about that doesn't mean it's true. Fellow Christian, no matter how troubled your feelings toward God and or your distressing difficulties might be at times, will you choose not to bail out in believing and following the Lord? When all is said and done during distressing times, it comes down to the choice or choices that you and I make. What or who will you choose to hold on tightly to in your distress messes? Will you hold tightly to your questions for God? Will you hold most tightly to your requests of God? Or will you hold most tightly to the Lord and your commitment to Him? You see, folks, if you think about it, questions and requests with regard to God are not meant to be held tightly. Because if you hold them tightly, what you end up is with fists that we sometimes might shake at God. And as if to say, until you answer me, until you give me what I want, uh, questions, requests, are not meant to be held tightly. They're meant to be released. They're meant to be released. Released to God as David did, so that in turn, then we we can be free with both hands, if you will, to cling tightly and hold tightly to our Lord, to trust in His hesed, His steadfast, unfailing love. 
to rejoice in his salvation for us, to sing praise to our Lord for, for who he is and what he has done for us in the past. Like King David, no matter what, will you as an individual, will all you collectively as a local church choose to keep trusting in, keep rejoicing in, keep singing to, and keep holding tightly to the Lord who loves you, saves you, and has been so very good to you? Is that what you choose to do? Will you? Really? I hope so. Because for believers in the Lord, isn't that, after all, the genuinely true test of distress? Let's pray together. With our heads bowed, I'd just like to ask, friend, if you've gone through or are going through a distressing time in your life, are there questions and requests that you feel God has not adequately addressed for you? If there are, are you re really okay with simply releasing those questions and requests to Him today and entrusting them to Him? Or do you harbor some anger, resentment, or bitterness toward the Lord because of those hmm, unanswered questions and unfulfilled requests? If that's the case, isn't it time to release, to let go of those questions and requests and just give them to Him, and even to repent of your sin, to have a deliberate change of mind about that anger, resentment, and bitterness you may harbor toward the Lord? To let it go out of your hand, so to speak, and out of your heart so that you can take his hand in faith again? Is now the time, is today the day, to renew your commitment to trust the Lord's love for you, rejoice in his salvation for you, and sing to him for his goodness for you? If so, just pray to him. Confess your sin, ask for his forgiveness, and let him know that with the help of the Holy Spirit in you as a believer in Christ, you want to be all in for Him, no matter what, going forward. Gracious Lord, we thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the example of King David. I thank You that You're big enough to handle all our hard questions, which really aren't hard questions to You that you're willing to hear our requests. But Lord, even in so doing, may we just trust you with them, trust you to answer the questions and fulfill the requests as you see fit, according to your will and in your time. And Lord, as we release those things to you, may it also be that we will continue to keep on keeping on with you no matter what, remembering your love, your salvation, and your past goodness to us. Help us, Lord, that we might honor you at all times and in all ways, even in our most troubling times. In Jesus' name, amen.